Academic coordinator of the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia and once more it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you, you all here tonight for the opening of the academic year 2015-2016. So welcome to you all, it is a pleasure to see uh, here our faculty that came to uh, support you uh, alumni, students uh, that are no more uh, uh, asked to be present every day at YAC, but they keep on coming and sharing their experience with, uh, with us and with you. Um, there are architects from Barcelona, there are uh, people that used to come to our lecture, to our lecture program, uh, but uh, mainly I see the most of the people in the audience is of course uh, you new students uh, of this academic year. So you are uh, 130 students in uh, several di different programs from the Master in Advanced Architecture 1, Master in Advanced Architecture 2, Open Thesis Fabrication, the, hosted, the program that we host uh, CIE, PhD program that we launched this year and Master in City and Technology that is also a new program that uh, a new master program that we launched this year. So it's uh, it's normal that uh, the the all is crowded with you and um, and you are the protagonist of this event. So uh, I would like I would ask everybody to welcome you with a warm applause because this is your day. And now to start the more uh, official part of the act, I would like to call uh, uh, the vice, uh, vice director of the area of architecture at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, Mr. Giuseppe Parcerissa, to come to say a few words to welcome you as well. Thanks, Giuseppe. Uh, it's for me a pleasure to, to be here again. As the third year, I will uh, uh, combine my activities and also these uh, kind of uh, uh, moments in your activities. Uh, I will say that are you welcome not just to the city or to the IAC, but also to the uh, Technical University of Catalonia. You know that our university is the, in a way, the, the the basic university in architecture here in Barcelona and the metropolitan area. We have two schools, and I would like that you will be uh, well welcome also at the libraries and other activities that will happen there in our schools. This is something a little bit particular uh, to be two different schools of architecture. I, I presume that some of you maybe have studied at our schools, but at the end you will finish your studies with a sort of a title that will be the, the Polytechnic University. What happens here, the, the question is that in a way, this is a so exciting city that is able to produce something so particular this is, as, as this institute. It is something very uh, curious uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an institution, but uh, produce something so exciting the, from the point of view of intellectual approaches and, and crafts and activities that it's uh, a sort of a pleasure as an academic, as official academic to be here and to have the opportunity to, to, to be uh, and to, to share uh, experience with yours. And also you are placed in a sort of a very interesting district in, in the city. This uh, uh, Pablo Nou. It's a very uh, particular place where the activities are changing, where the idea of a uh, city has something dynamic, where a lot of things could happen at the same time. It will be very different, where the conflict is part of the city, a uh, part of the life, and all of the things happens at the streets, in the streets, and it's able to produce a sort of a melting pot, very, very special. I will invite you to um, to discover this city and discover what he happens to be a student in Barcelona. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Giuseppe. It's very important for us the support of UPC in our activities and it was very nice from you to spend these words for our students. Our students. <laughs> So now is the moment to introduce you to um, 
a very important uh, person here at IAC, who is uh, the, a source of inspira continuous inspiration and initiative and activities. Uh, our academic director, um, Areti Markopoulou, who has been academic director in the past uh, four years, if I'm not wrong, uh, architect and engineer in Greece, uh, alumni from uh, the Master in Advanced Architecture, so you can imagine how, you can, how far you can uh, uh, arrive, um, FAB Academy alumni as well, and uh, faculty, it will be also faculty in one of the studios uh, in both of the Master in Advanced Architecture and in the Master in uh, City and Technology. So, uh, help me welcome you, uh, help me welcome uh, Areti Markopoulou. Thanks. What an introduction, Sylvie, thank you very much. Good afternoon to all, from my side as well, uh, to students and faculty, to collaborators and friends. Uh, today we are opening our lecture series uh, with our special guest, of course, Mr. Greg Lin. Greg, thank you very much for being here today with us. Uh, but as every year we take this opportunity uh, to organize a small opening for the master, postgraduate and PhD programs that we are running here at IAC. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Greg Lin, principal of Greg Lin Form, uh, a pioneer ar architect, one of the first professionals to introduce many of the things that we're working here at IAC, which is basically the means of digital design and digital manufacturing in architecture. And Greg is a person that he keeps on innovating in the field of architecture and construction. So it's a very uh, big honor and a great pleasure, Greg, to have you here uh, with us today in this special opening so thank you and welcome I would also like to welcome our 130 students coming from 47 different countries around the world and I do this I do this every year so allow me to do it this year as well I'm gonna name one by one the countries from where you are coming from because this exact multicultural identity is a principal uh, and important uh, key factor at the IAC activities and the IAC spirit and identity. So, you're coming from Australia, <laughs> Argentina, Angola, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada. Where is the spirit of Canadian people here? Thank you very much. Colombia, Denmark, Egypt, France, Gambia, Germany, Greece, oh my god, Iceland, India, Indone <laughs> Indonesia, Iran, Ireland, Italy, Jordan, Lebanon, yeah. Republic of Macedonia, Malaysia, Maldives, Mexico, Morocco, Netherlands, Nigeria, Norway, Pakistan, Palestine, Peru, Filipinas, Poland, Russia, Serbia, Slovakia, South Korea, Spain, <laughs> Syria, <laughs> Syria, Taiwan, Thailand, Turkey, Ukraine, UK, USA, and Venezuela. <laughs> so you, the students of coming from 47 countries, are gathering together this year at IAC enhancing its international nature, impact and reach. So thank you for that. You will very quickly realize that IAC is not a traditional school. It is rather a unique laboratory, a dynamic research, educational and production laboratory. During your studies, you will be exposed and contribute to research, knowledge and innovation. But more than that, you will be exposed to a unique scientific environment of exchange, making and sharing. You will get your hands dirty, this is for sure. You will definitely go through endless sleepless nights, we apologize for that from the very beginning. Your mind will go crazy, 
but be sure that you will be contributing to the development of the visions and the new tools for the 21st century of architecture and habitability. Our goal is not to treat you as pure students, but as the new change makers that both our discipline and our society need. The new change makers that will save the future of architecture, cities and technology. So I would like to share with you the IAC approach towards advanced architecture, that it is basically based on two fundamental strategies. First of all, the importance of acting on multiple scales and of course the necessity for the integration of multiple disciplines. IAC incorporates teaching and project realization from material nanoscale exploration to building design, from sensors and physical computing to the strategic development of master plans, from individuals to the global community, from bits to geography. Additionally, we are surrounded by collaborators and specialists coming from diverse fields. You will find faculty and experts that are biologists, engineers, arborists and permaculturers, from architects of course and designers to anthropologists and sociologists, from programmers and manufacturers to economists and policy makers. One of EAC's main commitments is to merge basic research with applied research. Through our educational programs we materialize our ideas, we are testing pilot projects, we apply innovative solutions and responding to the current needs of society. So in a profession such as architecture where it is important to know if new ideas are supported over time and of course at a larger scale, it is fundamental to test the process, to test the technologies or the fabrication solutions, the software and hardware incentive systems and the implementation arrangement. So that is the place to do so, an open laboratory. And to do so, we are glad to count also on the expertise of the industry and collaborative companies and integrate this into the academic and research environment. At the same time, we also count on the support of the European Commission with numerous European uh, research grants that contribute to the EAC's high-end architecture and design research. EAC is a small, independent and global hub of visionary people. And of course it is located in Barcelona. That is the perfect city to be. A city with an amazing richness of history and culture. A reference in technology, innovation and humanism. Together with local associations, institutions and professionals in Barcelona, we work together to set up the basis for being the pioneers in the transformation of our current and future cities. We wish to all together define how the architects will influence the way we live, interact and communicate in these new global contexts. As part of being in Barcelona, we are committed to develop new categories of projects, technologies and solutions that can be exported systema systematically to the cities of the world, helping them so to be more efficient and more human. I wish to close highlighting the importance of the huge EA community spread over, all over the world. The Masters alumni community counts with more than uh, 1,000 alumni in 70 different countries, more than 100 local and international faculty and collaborators, and of course partnerships with numerous leading international companies and institutions. This community is contributing to the fact that EAC is now in a process of growing and opening up to more challenges. We are expanding our team, incorporating international and local experts in different fields. We are setting up new educational programs focused on architecture and urbanism. We are consolidating our cooperation with the European Commission in Brussels, expanding our applied research project with new European grants. We are working on new projects for education and urban transformation in China. We are contributing to the implementation of the tools of digital fabrication in the fab city of Barcelona and the world, led basically by Tomás Díez, the director of Fab Lab Barcelona. We are also setting up a new academic and research activities on the urban scales and the urban sciences, basically led by Willy Muller and Vicente Wyart. We are also consolidating an advanced theory and knowledge line led by the by IAC founder Manuel Gausa. 
All this being developed understanding that the new challenges in architecture, design and technology lie in the capacity of the improvement of the present and the future of society and its relation with its inhabitant. We wish to welcome you all to the IA community and we invite each one of you and all of you together to actively participate, exchange and propose. Thank you for being here today and please be part of the IA community. I am not done. <laughs> I am not done because I would like to spend some minutes and, and please allow me to present our special guest, uh, Greg Lynn. Mr. Greg Lynn, he's actually a new friend for me. We've met like a few years back in, in, in the Venice Biennale when you were winning the Golden Lion back in 2008 with your amazing installation in Arsenale. A few years, few years later we met in Los Angeles and now for the first time we meet here in Barcelona. Uh, Greg Lin is a very is a new friend to me, but he's a very good and old friend of IAC. I think uh, he came and lectured here at IAC about ten years back, when we were at another building, when we were at another scale. So it is really uh, a great pleasure to have you lecturing here today, in this specific moment. Well, uh, as you all very well know, Greg is one of the most influential figures on rethinking design across many disciplines. The buildings, projects and publications associated with his office, Greg Lean Form, have been influential in the acceptance and use of advanced materials and technologies for design and fabrication. He is distinguished for his design to produce complex architectural forms, as he was one of the first to work and promote the idea that the information era and computers can be the mediators so that mathematics and calculus can be implemented into the generation of architectural expression. Greg is also doing high-end research and work, exploring how to integrate structure and form together. And he has tested this from big-scale installation to furniture or even plastic toys, rethinking children's toys as new building blocks. He's a great practitioner and thinker, He's teaching in several schools such as the UCLA, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, the Angevande, the Yale University and much more. With a background education in both architecture and philosophy, Greg has been writing and publishing internationally, always debating the processes of design with the, with the digital means. His work uh, can be found in permanent collection of the most important design and architectural museums, such as the San Francisco MoMA, the, uh, the, CC the CCA, and, as, and of course the MoMA in New York. He is currently developing an experimental research, research robotics labs in UCLA. I hope he will talk about this today. And he's one of the lead professors at IDEAS campus and the Supra Studio in UCLA, which is an innovative campus serving as an incubator to explore topics arising from different fields, such as film, automotive, aerospace, and tech industries. An architect, philosopher, educator, but more than that, a visionary and a pioneer mind, Mr. Greg Lin, thank you very much for being here today. The floor is yours, and please help me welcome him on board. The talk uh, that will hopefully be relevant to EAC. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the school is that digital technology here is not taught in a vocational manner. I don't know if that word vocation makes sense, but a vocational school is where you go to learn skills. Um, here, digital technology is put in the service of broad culture, urbanism, energy, environment, and it has been from the very start. I know when I first came here and was learning about the mission of the school, what was so impressive was that, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, that was already the idea. And so, in a little bit of a similar way, I, I pulled some things together. I pulled together some old things, uh, which I'll show you kind of where I was 12 years ago. 
and then I pulled together some new things and I, I really feel like I was probably out of step with what was going on at EAC 12 years ago or 10 years ago and I feel like I'm much more in step with what's happening here. Um, but anyway, so I pulled together some things and tried to, to, you know, just have a conversation with you about what's going on. Um, one theme that's going to run through tonight, just because it's on my mind, is boats. Um, and, and it is something I've noticed anyway, that architects tend to love boats. I think, like buildings, uh, boats do some things that get me excited, the first of which is that they're not static, that they move. And I know 12 years ago, I was not interested in environments that would move. And really now, that's all I'm interested in. Um, one reason people like, architects like boats, is because they're nostalgic. And I think tech, digital technology has been dealt with very nostalgically. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I tend to think that, that digital tools make too many surfaces, they make too many systems, they're too tectonic, very kind of Germanic the way they get used. Um, and there's a kind of nostalgia about digital technology I want to talk about. And then finally, I mean, I think most architects love boats just because they're not boxes. You can't really sail a box. So they tend to involve curves. So that was a picture of Alvar Alto. He had a boat. Uh, which, you know, it was said he never spent more time on any project, not just at scale, but never did more drawings than he did drawings of his boat. And, uh, and also his boat sunk. It sunk the day it was launched. It went right down the ramp and into the water and sunk. Um, so I, I think a lot about that project. What, what I really think is interesting is how much the boat influence the architecture and vice versa. And the language of the boat and its faceting and curvature, that's not a normal looking boat, it's an architecture boat. And that's not normal looking architecture, that's boat architecture. And even at the level of details and things, the figure from the Alto chair, you then see on the Alto boat. And um, that dialogue in terms of form and construction is one thing. I think what for me has been interesting is a dialogue about performance and, and making a thing which is a high performance object. Um, around, I think it was maybe even 1999, but I, I found this ad from 2000. Uh, a lot of architects saw in the magazines these Prada ads, and they were actually ads for clothing, but they had this photograph of their America's Cup boat, and it had these sails, and the sails were built in a completely new way, and I saw this image, and I thought, my God, that sail looks like a drawing, like a kind of Palladian hatching, or it, it looks like uh, somebody drafted that sail. I wonder what's going on with it. And it, it took me about, well, less than six months to find the person that made that sale, go to their factory and see what they were doing. And it really changed things for me uh, in a lot of ways. The first of which is it got me very invested in fabrication. So when I went to the factory where they make this sale, this is what I saw. I saw uh, a mold the size of your school that was dynamically deformable to the flying shape of the sail. And then on that mold was a giant CNC arm, the biggest one I'd ever seen, that drew carbon in the path of the loads of the sail. And so they would analyze the structure in terms of fiber scale construction and lay the fibers only where they needed to be in the in the the line that the load would be exerted on. So instead of a big, thick, redundant structure, this was an incredibly lightweight, high performance, computer numerically controlled construction. And I thought, this is where I want to go. I want to go into fabrication. Now, 
I would just say now, looking back, that fabrication does not equal design. Sometimes fabrication ends up repeating all of the things that were not digital before. So, for instance, the, the first reaction of my generation, not my generation, the, the people working with digital technology in the late 80s and early 90s, was we were given a tool and told this is a tool that can handle complex problems, like calculating every piece of a building being a different size. And so our reflex was to say, well then let's make things more complex. It meant that there was a kind of explosion of layers, there was an ex of systems, so you would have primary structure, secondary structure, envelope, rain screen, uh, you know, briselet, like all of a sudden you saw buildings which were just made out of more unique parts than was previously possible. Um, and you were, everyone was trying to maximize the intricacy of that. You know, my own version of that was the Korean Presbyterian Church where every single structural member was a unique length with a unique angle with a unique detail. And we actually had to do the structural drawings for all those details and all those elements because we were the ones that had the computer. And every single surface in the building is a unique size and shape. So this was an example of getting a tool and figuring out how to make things as complex as possible for yourself. <clears throat> and by the way, it was built out of more layers than you would typically build with. In another way, uh, I saw what was happening, you know, mostly with the studio I used to have at the ETH and thought, well, I should think about masonry and I should think about bricks. And so if normally a brick is modular and it's stacked in a coursing pattern which is modular, I thought, well, let's invent a brick which is non-modular and it's stacked in a non-repeating way. And so we arrayed the bricks uh, along parametric paths. We generated all the intersections and programmed robots to cut all those bricks and then we welded them all together into these interior walls in a dome. We did this furniture and fountains with the ducks, which you can actually get a golden lion for, which is kind of criminal. Um, but again, I was taking a, a logic which predated the digital and adding a layer of complexity and intricacy to it. Okay, so and then finally in terms of decoration and surface, in this I have to say I realized I just stole from Bernard Kesh. And Bernard is a person who is here and still comes here regularly. I guess he's coming to give a lecture. So the person that really invented digital fabrication is Bernard Kesh. And what's amazing about Bernard is he had an idea about fab labs. Before there was an idea of fab labs, Bernard Cash said, I want to set up micro factories all over the world. I'll have algorithms which will design panels and I will email those algorithms to these micro factories and supply panels for the entire world for their building industry. And, and it actually came true. I have to say we all thought he was crazy and we all thought you're competing with Ikea, but actually what he said would happen, happened faster than anybody ever imagined. But anyway, this idea of also adding texture and decoration to surfaces was another layer of, I would say, added complexity. And this for me was the project of the computer, was adding a layer of complexity, you know, for, to achieve certain results. <clears throat> okay, but so that was, that was about 15, 10, 15 years ago, back when your school was being founded. So now things have really changed for me. And it's mostly because of this exhibition at the Canadian Center of Architecture called Archaeology of the Digital, where very innocently 
they, they acquired the embryological house of mine, and I said to them, hey, would you like me to give you all my digital files? Because I, I designed 50,000 of these houses. I've seen maybe 1,000 of them. But there's this archive of them that we've never really looked at, but that you're more than welcome to have. But I don't know what you'll do with it. And so the Canadian Center undertook a two-year study of how to preserve digital materials and ended up starting this digital archive where they have now 25 projects collected in their native digital format. Um, but so I've been helping them to identify those and in the process have been going back through and looking at all these digital projects of my colleagues in the 90s. And what I discovered is that what we now think of as digitally rich, immersive, interactive environments were already not only thought up, but built and realized in the 80s and 90s by architects like Lars Brybrook, Koss Oosterhuis. I mean, they were making scale robots that were bouncing around. They were making immersive spaces with sensor technology and projections that would know who the people in the room were. They were doing everything that's going on in the world of technology, and it was being cooked up by the architects. And I, I thought, why didn't that thread continue and why aren't the architects in the equation there and why is everybody just making stuff? So the the interactive and dynamic building project, which I kind of thought other people were going to take care of and I didn't want to take that on, it ended up just stopping in favor of fabrication. The other thing I realized was we were all using computational fluid dynamics back then but it would just take you a week to make one run, whereas now you can do it interactively. So I decided to kind of go back and look at some of those themes again. And this is where the boat thing came in, is that I'd written a, a book called Animate Form, where I, I tried to preclude having buildings move. And it was because I was using animation software, and all the journalists would say, I mean, people outside of the field of architecture would say, since you're using animation software, doesn't that mean your buildings should move? Like, shouldn't this be like the future we were all promised where buildings would be moving and interactive? And I use this example where I said, the form of a boat hull stores motion and flow on its surface and it's designed to perform in multiple directions. So when you sail downwind, the hull is meant to plane, so lift off the surface. And when you go into the wind, it's meant to lean over or heel and present a greater surface area to the water, like more length. But that the boat never has to change its shape. That all these multiple vectors are built into one static shape. And so that was my argument for why you would have animation built into a static form. And so that was my line for 10 years. I would always say, this is stored motion. It's stored animation. The building makes you move because the multiple movements are stored in the volume. Um, and it was really to avoid having to deal with things that would be dynamic. Um, so that's something I wanted to pick up. The other thing is in this model, I realized everything I was describing was happening on one surface. So this idea of a boat hull, it wasn't made out of 25 different layers with different decorative patterns and textures. It had all of these different forces built into one surface. So this idea of a, of a minimal surface uh, was really taught to me by Rolf Fellbaum, who, he just stepped down from Vitra, but he used to run Vitra. And Rolf asked if I wanted to do a chair, and he's really the greatest mentor to architects. I mean, he gave Zaha his first building, he's got a whole collection of great buildings in, in uh, Willem Rhein and Basel, but what he really is, he's like a mentor to people, kind of in the middle of their careers. And he said to me, look, I think you're ready to try a chair, but I'm pretty sure you're going to fail. 
because a chair is much harder to do than a building. And he said, so why don't you bring two or three ideas and we'll see where it goes. So I brought three designs and I remember I showed him the first one and I said, Rolf, we're going to 3D print these chairs and it's going to be made out of thousands of pieces that could only be made with a 3D printer and it'll be the most innovative chair you've ever done. And he said, wait a minute, you're going to build a chair out of a thousand pieces? And I said, yeah. He said, look, in the history of the world, nobody has ever made something more complex and been innovative. It just doesn't exist. I think the word he used was retarditaire. And so I said, okay, let me show you my other idea. <laughs> and <laughs> my other idea was to build a chair out of two parts. And he said, that's innovation. So this idea that reducing parts, minimizing assembly, that is the gospel of innovation. In every industry but architecture, that's what people consider to be innovative. Making a thing out of fewer things with fewer steps. Um, which doesn't mean monolithic, but, but that's what's seen as being innovative. So, as well, having multiple uses or multiple orientations of the same surface is also a bonus. And, and finally, integrating systems is also innovation. So, I mean, this is a chair we did. It's not a special chair, but you get the idea. Instead of legs and a seat and a back, with, a, with arms, it's built out of one hard surface, which makes the base, and it's built out of one soft surface, which is three-dimensionally knitted by the automobile company. So that was kind of the technology part of it, is it wasn't sewn, it was, it was knitted, like a, like a pair of Nike shoes. And so those two, there's a little more than two parts in the end, but we took a lot of assembly and a lot of fabrication out of the system here. And, and again, made a surface which, um, I don't have a pointer, but it doesn't. The, you kind of have to demonstrate it, but if you throw your leg, if you turn 90 degrees and throw your leg over the arm and the back, and then throw your arm over the spot where your neck would go, you can sit on the chair sideways. And it's called a ravioli chair because they connect together into big sheets. So people can kind of sit and talk to each other back to back or side to side like a love seat. So it works like a love seat in a chair at the same time in the same surface. So this idea of over reading a surface. So I'm not going to go into all this stuff, but instead of adding handles, building the handles into the surface of the coffee pot or instead of having a handle on a cup, having the cup have like 200 handles all the way around so you hold it and don't burn your hand. But it's always for me about eliminating additional parts and integrating things into the logic of surfaces. So this kind of aesthetic and ethic of incorporating materials, layers, systems, all into fewer and fewer surfaces, trying to make surfaces act like structure, that's really kind of uh, where I started to shift. Um, scaling that up, I think probably the best example I have is the, the Bloom House, where the, the family that lives there gave me a, a little bit of a oxymoron of a request. They said, we want to have a cozy, intimate house that's like a loft with lots of uh, pockets and also lots of spaces to hang art. So everything was kind of in, oh thanks, everything was kind of in opposition to each other. So what we did with the plan and, and really the, the 3D was to have just two walls and a floor and a ceiling and to make rooms by curving the walls and making these pockets and folds. So you'll see in the photographs. As well in the ceiling, the ceiling folds down so that it doesn't feel too big and empty. 
but they can still have nice high walls for big paintings. And, that, and the windows also all pinch together and form one continuous strip. So it's like one window, like a ribbon window, but that ribbon window pinches to make kind of different character. Um, what we really did was absorb all of the systems of the building. So the hearth and the fireplace, that's an off the shelf firebox but it's incorporated into that one wall that runs the whole length of the house. And we did that all the way down to the scale of kitchen cabinets and furniture, things like that. You know, I said I didn't want any metal cabinet pulls, so we just deformed the surfaces of the cabinet fronts to get rid of all that extra stuff. So this was a mission to be a minimalist, but to be a minimalist by adding curvature and intelligence to surfaces. Um, and it's also, by the way, a very cheap house. Like, I didn't want to add materials to make it seem luxurious. Um, so all of this stuff is really just in how, how we were forming things and in integrating things, not really in upgrading materials and, uh, and, and construction complexity. So, very similar thing with the site Santa Fe Museum. I think this is really where I started to use, if I back up, I wanted to have a translucent ceiling, and so we built what is the equivalent of a 12 meter boat on the ceiling of the house, um, where we use this translucent fiberglass. And this was the first time I ever made anything that scale with fiberglass. The, the, the ravioli chairs are fiberglass, and we made the molds for those. But for the ceiling, we had to become what I would call mold designers. And I'm a really good mold designer. I'm probably a better mold designer than I am an architect. Um, because we have a lot of experience in how to make a mold where you can make a part and have the part release. And really the trick with composites is how to make the mold cheaply and how to design the object so it releases from the mold so you can do a mold in one part. Because when you start to do 20 part molds, you start to come up with difficulties in lining things up. So anyway, so the for me what's become the the material of choice for intelligent surfaces has really become composites. You know, fiber reinforced sandwiches. Um, sandwiches meaning foam with layers of, of structure on both sides and systems in between. Um, and the way to engineer that is using finite element analysis and the way to design it is using computational fluid dynamics. So to go back to that machine that I showed you that was laying down the carbon, we've done two projects with North Sales where we've transferred their technology. One is with these carbon crystal sails where we built these interior um, walls that are thin carbon reinforced translucent skins um, where the crystals are laid in in the manufacturer. The, the kind of structurally more interesting project is we did these chairs, which I'll make a couple claims, which I'm pretty sure I could make. I think this is the lightest chair on earth ever. Um, I could be wrong, but it, it weighs about six ounces. Depends on which one it is, but this weighs six ounces and I had over a thousand pounds of architects in it on New Year's Eve. Um, and it, it's a tensile structure, but I've never liked tensile structures because they always hang. Like the material just takes the form of the, of the load. Whereas this stuff is made as a tape, and I know this is actually the lightest carbon tape on Earth that they make for the sails. And it falls apart in your fingers if you handle it. So the way you lay the tape down is they have these machines that lay down tapes. You know, you can go as little as three layers in a, in a 
30, 60, 90 orientation, or you can lay up up to, because you, you bake this, up to 20 or more layers. So these machines, you give them the pattern where you want the tape placed, and it lays down and cuts all those layers of tapes into a preform, and then you take that preform and put it on a rigid mold like this, and then you put that mold in an oven, and you put a vacuum on it, and you cook it and vacuum bag it to consolidate all of the structure onto the mold. And what's great is then when you take the thing out, it takes the form that it was molded to. But it's flexible. So um, these chairs I can crumple up in my hand and put in an envelope and mail to you. And then you take it out of the envelope and just shake it and it snaps right back into its sitting shape. And when they're hanging, they hang in the sitting shape, but then when you sit in it, it automatically becomes soft. So it's technically a compression structure, the way you're seeing it right now, but then the minute you load it, it turns into a tension structure. So a very low load, it's a compression form, and then as you load it up, it turns into a tension form. And the other thing about it is with different glues, parts of it are rigid, like at the ends, and then in the middle it's soft. So you can go from rigid to flexible all in a single material construction just by changing the glue. So, um, and, and the thing we were kind of thinking about with these was chairs which you didn't have to inventory and chairs you could ship around. And um, Anyway, the, the way we did it, the, the cooking and the baking, it's a long cycle time meaning it takes about 12 hours to cook one. Um, and it's a little bit labor intensive, so you know they're not as cheap as we'd like them to be, you know, but they're a couple hundred bucks to make. So this, this thinking about materials and thinking about logistics, I mean, I thought I would just show you this one little animation. I was asked to do the pavilions for the index awards, which are the largest design awards in the world financially, and um, they're based on sustainability. It's called Design to Improve Life. And so Index said, we want you to do these pavilions. They ship every six weeks across an ocean. They wanted them to last for two years. And they wanted them to be uh, good for the environment and the materials. And it's Danish. So they said, so you should probably make them out of wood. And so we looked at wood. And I asked them what the last pavilions uh, cost. And they told me, they don't want me saying what things cost, but they cost X amount of money. And that was the budget I had to work with. And they said they cost that much because to ship these around for two years costs five times as much as it costs to make them. And it's because they went in 12 shipping containers. So what we did is came up with a design where all nine pavilions could fit in a half of one shipping container. So I could be three times over budget and we still save them a lot of money, like millions of euros of money. And the only way to get them strong enough that you could flat pack them that compact was to use carbon fiber. So we then looked at the stored energy in the carbon fiber we used versus the stored energy in plywood and it turns out using a little bit of a bad material like carbon fiber is much better than using a whole lot of good material with anti-pest treatment, with anti-rot treatment, with waterproofing treatment. So in the end, carbon fiber was more ecological than wood. So um, it also is where I learned lightweight. You know, if you want to be thinking about sustainability, use less stuff. And the problem with sustainability is they try to sell everybody stuff rather than telling people to use less stuff. So we've really been using these resins and glasses and carbons and finding out that there's huge, huge financial savings to it. And that's one material I don't see at EAC is lots of laminates, but it's the way you save budget and save material is building light. Okay, so 
sorry, indulge me for 10 minutes. I'm going to just talk about boats, but it has a lot to do with architecture. Um, I think, you know, the first thing is it focused a little bit this idea of minimalism. So uh, this is probably the most beautiful, fast, and perfect boat of this genre ever made. Nobody's going to really do much better. David Chipperfield is trying very hard to do better, but I don't think he's going to do better than this. Um, it's a boat called Chow Johnny, and it's the apex of a certain type of structure. First, it's very refined and featureless. So when I say uh, surface minimalism, I don't mean featureless. But here, everything's just been taken away. Like it's all invisible. Everything is under the deck. Second thing is, it's in extremely good taste. The reason it's in good taste is it's rooted in a historic paradigm. It looks like a boat. Um, it looks like a very elegantly refined boat. Um, and what I'm going to show you doesn't look like a boat at all. Second thing is it's really big, because in this kind of a boat, bigger is better. And I won't go into why that is. This is the kind of boat I'm interested in. This is a boat that transferred technology from aerospace to boats. So this boat doesn't even sit in the water. It flies on wings that lift it up, it lift it up out of the water to reduce the surface area. And it has a lot of details. I mean, I would say it has a medley of details, and it has appendages all over it, meaning it has wands and foils and wings and spars. Um, and they all are of their own language, but they're all integrated together. So this paradigm, like this is not the kind of boat I'm interested in, like a good taste, historic, refined boat. I'm interested in a weird technology transfer, high performance, uh, medley of details boat. So I decided to design a boat for myself, uh, and I decided to indulge myself in all the things I was doing with buildings in the 90s in a thing that had to perform or I would die. So. Um, it really was for me a test in making a high performance thing. And I never thought that I would build the fastest 40 foot ocean boat in the world. But with maybe one or two exceptions, you'll see it's the fastest boat you could sail on an ocean. Um, done by a total amateur with a lot of digital technology. So, and with, with a naval architect. But the task for me was to go back to animation and figure out how animation would work on this. And so the first thing we did is worked with a team of computational fluid dynamicists. And uh, because they were working for free, they wanted to experiment on us. So this is the first time anybody ever combined hydroanalysis, which you can see as it goes through the water, it's showing you the pressure, along with aerodynamic analysis, which are the the streamlines that's producing the power. So it meant that a, a little bit of the information we got was kind of garbage because it wasn't calibrated to an expert, but it, it gave us some interesting insight. So to do that, the first thing we had to do was a sketch. This is the very first sketch I did before we ever got the team together. I was wrong about a lot of stuff, but it shows intent. And the intent was really to make this as little as possible, but to make this as wide as possible, because I'd like to sail this boat to Hawaii with one other person and I need a place to be inside it. And so this makes it wide where you need to have the space and the rest makes it minimal so you don't have a lot of drag. So we started off using animation tools where you can see these two chines, these two edges that run the length of the boat, one is there for performance, which is that one. I won't tell you what, why. The other one is there to make volume, which is just so that there's some space inside it. This is the same view looking down the length. So we ended up with a, with a language more or less like this, which was a combination of finding room for an interior 
and dealing with the performance, which is these boats don't tip over sideways, they go end over end. And so that's why the front is the way it is. And in fact, I kind of started with the interior while we handed this off to the, to the design team. And so those are all the interior elements. The naval architect and the builder said, look, you're not going to have a race boat if you build all these interiors. It should just be empty and people just lay in cots. And that's all you're allowed to have, that and a little camp stove with propane. So I tried to, well, I'll show you what we did with the interiors. But so we came up with this platform. We ran it through a lot of computational fluid dynamics. Um, some of which you can see here, because nobody's driving this boat. You just kind of put it in the computer and let it go. It always ends badly eventually. Um, but <laughs> you kind of learn. <laughs> it would be too ambitious to think you could just put the boat in the water, it could sail away perfectly. But we were learning a lot. We were learning things about the width, the volume of the hulls, and most importantly, the placement of that little curved foil, you'll see. Okay, we do, we're doing the same thing in terms of the aerodynamics, because it, it goes fast enough that minimizing aerodynamic drag is actually a significant part of it. So everywhere you see red, that's what's called unattached flow. And so, and we would get, this would take a day. So, I don't know, maybe two dozen times, we would change all the surfaces to try to reattach the flow as, as um, it would move over the boat. And one of the things it did is forced us to integrate all of these kinds of elements into the structure. So the other thing is we, we built a lot of this ourselves. And I mean, kind of like every evening in the office for a while, we hired a surfboard maker for six months. And at four o'clock, everybody would throw on their laminating clothes and we would start laminating all the furniture because we knew that if the furniture failed, I wouldn't die. So what we did is we made molds or tools uh, and then we built it as light as we could using EPS foam, which is very inexpensive. So uh, we cut these molds on a Pressex mill just like you've got. We coated them uh, and waxed them and then would laminate them with skins of either fiberglass or carbon, vacuum bag them to consolidate them, then take a foam core and cut the foam core and lay it in and glue it, laminate that, and then do an outer layer, and then again vacuum consolidate the whole thing, and then weigh it, and all that furniture which is two couches, a chair, a little kitchenette, and a equivalent of a California king size bed, weighed 55 pounds before we painted it, and it weighed 80 pounds after we painted it. So the actual construction weighed just a little bit more than the paint that we put on it. But so we got a whole interior for 80 pounds, which nobody's ever built interiors like this. They always build it like they're at Ikea or something out of panels. So it was all painted by a hot rod painter in Venice Beach. And then for the molds for the boat itself, we also delivered CNC cut tooling. So um, these stations were cut. They were put together by a boat builder, a very good boat builder in Southern California called Westerly Marine. And I think what I want to point out here is just this is all the carbon fiber used to make the whole boat, and that is all the foam used to make the whole boat. The only other thing we needed was a half of a drum of glue. So you'll see how big this thing is, but we made it all out of maybe two van loads of material. You know, not, not much material. Extremely expensive material, but not much of it. Um, so these molds were made very conventionally. And to make this happen, I had to do a lot of uh, bartering and favors from friends. And one friend is Bill Chrysler. And Bill has an 80 foot long CNC cutting machine up in Sonoma County. And so we got these big blocks of foam and Bill cut all the molds for the hulls. So that's half of the main hull. 
that's the mold for one of the arms. And then that's all the molds. They came down in three trucks to the boat builders. And we ended up building it exactly the same way we built the furniture, which is, you know, lightly filled it, sprayed it with a mold release and a wax, took this fiber, which you see comes in rolls, and just like the sails, you only put the fiber where you need it. So there were two layers over the whole thing just to give it the structure. And then in some places, we added 120 layers of additional fiber for stiffness. So then we put a foam core in it, vacuum bag it, and you get a finished part. And this, this is one of the arms that holds it. If you support the arm at one end and at the middle, so with 100% cantilever, it will deflect less than a centimeter with 13 tons of load on it. So, and that thing, two of us could carry around. It weighs not even 120 kilos. So it's more or less nine times stronger than the equivalent steel, but because we make it like a hollow tube, it's even stronger than, a, than an I-beam. So that it's much stronger than any of the steel in this building and weighs almost nothing. So the other thing is you don't bolt things together, which is the, the biggest fetish that architects have is mechanical methods of attachment. Like most buildings want to just be glued together. They end up getting glued and silicon together anyway. Um, but in this, obviously you don't, there's a lot of reasons you don't use metal. But so you can see here, the whole boat was put together by gluing and bonding until we got, that's the main hull. That's with all the interiors in it. That's kind of the inside view. And then the arms get bonded on and the outer hulls get bonded on. The one thing is I was very, there were some pieces of metal that were left on the boat that I didn't want to have to have and we couldn't put, we couldn't drill a hole anywhere in it. We had to glue everything because if you drill a hole, the whole thing could explode. So we came up with this language for all the little pieces of metal hardware where we built these little platforms for everything. So these we also made you know, kind of evenings and weekends, I made these parts. And those ended up getting glued and bonded and fared into the whole boat. So it really becomes monolithic in the sense of detail. Like the details all merge into the surfaces. And it's, it's also very, you notice it's asymmetrical. Um, so that's it kind of painted with all the metal hardware on it. We contemplated making our own hardware, but that seemed too much. But you can see that all the mounts and pads for all the hardware are all custom and integrated. That's it kind of painted. Um, but so I have this anti-metal bias for two reasons. One is weight, just weighs so much more than a fiber and is so much less strong. The second thing is a carbon boat in salt water is a battery. So it eats all the metal um, once you put it in salt water. So you can see the way you, everything is attached is all like an old uh, schooner or something. Everything is all lashed and tied. There's no metal, there's no bolts, there's no screws. Everything gets tied with a fiber. These fibers are close to 20 times stronger than the equivalent steel. Um, and they don't stretch at all. So, and they weigh nothing. Like 1,200 of them could fit in my pocket. So the last parts that were metal were the isms, like these quadrants and those rudder arms. And what everybody told me is you just make those out of aluminum, like billet aluminum. You cut them with a mill. And so because I had 3D printed some metal, we considered 3D printing them in aluminum or 3D printing them in titanium. And at the same time, Frank Gehry, who I sail with every Sunday, we're both in LA, was building this crazy boat for a, a partner of his. And Frank wanted to do some stuff in metal, so I said, well, I'm thinking of 
titanium 3D printing some, and Frank, of course, said, oh, well, I have these giant parts we should 3D print in titanium. So here's a video of, so we ended up, help, we ended up kind of coordinating the 3D printed titanium parts on that project for him. And this is a Boeing machine that's, it's actually welding little beads of titanium. It's not sintering it, it's laying down a TIG weld continuously of titanium. And then that's one of the finished parts. And that's another finished part. And that's about two and a half meters long. And that's the part on the boat. And those are the parts on the boat. That's Hermann Frères, who Frank designed the boat with. But so, so instead of doing the 3D printed titanium, we decided to do it in a non-metallic way and print it in fiber reinforced nylon. Um, and you can see we had to the language of the parts is a little bit the language of aluminum in the sense that there are gussets and fillets and things. Um, we could have done better with that, but, but frankly this was modeled in an afternoon. And that's the quadrant. And we took those parts, uploaded them, three days later Federal Express came and we had finished working parts. And I was just with the head of engineering at Oracle like no boat has ever had working 3D printed parts um, on it. And these are the most critical parts on the whole boat, I would say, because it's the steering. So, and again, you weigh it. So all four of those parts weigh eight pounds. The rest of the steering system, anyway, probably not so interesting. Then that's what the parts look like when they're done. In terms of the look and feel of the boat, I wanted it to be more like this than that first boat I showed you. Um, and so this is a pinstriping job by a guy named Don Q down in uh, Orange County. So he did all the, the lettering, but also all the language of it, like this kind of slip decal with the pinstripe around it. And then all the hatches and things to get in and out of the boat, we did in this live edge acrylic, which that's a carbon mold and we vacuum formed it. Um, that's it installed. Just so you get a sense for how light it is, that's it getting launched. That's it in the water with no mast yet. Um, that's us sailing. After we, we did one race, our first race, I'll show you, we won by an incredible amount. But then the second day, we broke that orange thing. Um, <laughs> so. It, it actually, you can see there's a negative uh, hollow to it. So these are asymmetrical foils, so they're like wings. They're actually, they're, the profile is taken from the human-powered airplane, the propeller of it. So they generate a lot of lift at a very low speed. And the only part that wasn't engineered by a French engineer named Hervé DeVoe is those. And it turns out those were the things that broke. So the second race, one snapped off. Um, and I just because it's funny, I got an email from one of the people I was racing against who said, hey, I think I just found your foil on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> so it had floated 26 miles to Catalina Island and somebody found it and so within a week we had it back from Craigslist, just in case you don't think social media works. Um, this isn't a very exciting shot of it, but you, the principle of it is that those orange boards with the tabs on the end lift the boat out of the water. So even though there's hardly any wind and we're barely moving, you can see that the that this hull is hardly touching the water and this hull is only in the water for about eight or ten feet. So the whole point of this thing is it lifts up out of the water as you get going. This is a video that one of the crew shot on that first race we did and what's just for the power of good design, like I'm not a very good sailor, and these are not, these are just my friends. And we, on a 30 mile race, beat every other boat by a minimum of 10 miles. And that includes a fully foiling catamaran sailed by a two time Olympic medalist. Um, but so, really, if you get good design constraints, 
and you use the technology in the right way, you get a really good result. I mean, I would say in terms of design technology, only some America's Cup boats spent three years digitally modeling this. And this is actually kind of a more fun video. This is with my kids. But what's nice about the boat is it goes 25 miles an hour when you just go for a cruise with your kids. So it's also very safe. It's not like a super high-tech thing. Um, my daughter had been begging to try to, to have me get her wet. And you'll see in a minute, when she gave up, we got her soaked. But it's a little, it's a little windy is the only thing. You see the power boat struggling to keep up with us. It's, it's really, I, I gotta say, it's great to do a building and have people use it. It's great to do a chair and go somewhere and see it sitting in some stranger's place and see them using it. But there's nothing better than designing something that performs. You know, that's a high performance object that doesn't, well, it's failed plenty, but th that works. Okay, so anyway, that was kind of my return to movement and motion. And so that idea of things that moved that I rejected, the last few years, all I want to do is stuff that moves. Um, I mean, I, all I want to do is projectiles, that's Bernard's term, but you know, a boat that moves by the force of wind and water with no engine, nothing like that, it's, you know, that's great. Um, and I'm trying to drive movement now into all the projects we do in the office. I'm trying to drive movement into all of the studios I'm teaching. It's really about that. And what I've found in the last, really, year is, and it, w it was a, a client that said this to me. He said, look, our business is at the intersection of the digital and the physical and what you're doing is at the intersection of the digital and the physical. And for me, it was returning back to movement and mobility that made me realize this is where the action is in terms of the physical and the information. So this is, a, this is something we did at UCLA with the Salk Institute. It's with a neuroscientist who wanted to do a study of, um, of perception but what we have there is a real tight link between Maya software and the robots where we actually run the robots with Maya through a software from Bot and Dolly. Um, and you can see this, you know, this was just a test of when you could see a moving image go. And the, the supposition was that if you clamp somebody's head in a vise and change a pattern that they see it and if you actually moved the screen, they assumed it would be exactly the same. But it turns out seeing a thing moving is different than just seeing a moving image. Uh, for the London Olympics with Christian Moeller, it was the first time I tried to think about a robot in a building because Christian is a sculptor, trained as an architect, but a sculptor that does a lot of things with universal robot arms. So for this, we made a proposal of having a golden dome outside the, actually it was right next to Zaha's um, aquatic center, that there would be this gold dome, but that it would be able to spin to follow the crowds, and it would be able to tilt and point following the crowds by sitting on a three, three KUKA Titan um, arms on columns. And so here you kind of get the idea of how it moves around. But this was the first thing I ever proposed that would actually literally move. So this is a bunch of years old. But it's a first, and it was Christian that really kind of got me thinking about how to use a robot like a column. And because of that, um, I was asked to do a dynamic interior um, for an architecture festival in Belgium. And one of the themes they were working with was small spaces, trying to get things small. So I decided to, to you know, try to make the thing roll. 
and the idea of the rolling we used was from the rolling tubes of the Ivy Museum, which I didn't see it at the time, but my father-in-law said, oh, you know, that I-beam thing is like Picasso's bulls. And I didn't quite get it until we came up with this rolling structure, which ended up now, in retrospect, looking a lot like the Picasso bulls, but it was all parametrically modeled to make a structural truss out of just one continuous tube. Not literally like a tube you'd extrude, but it's one single member that makes the entire truss and it rolls. And so those kind of rolled continuous figures is what we started with for this house. House prototype, I mean this isn't meant to be a house. Um, but what it is, is you can see, here's a kind of like a bedroom, like sleeping area that fits in a 60 square meter footprint. And now, don't worry about how you get there, but that's now the kitchen and a bathroom that also fits in less than a 60 square meter area. And then that's a dining room and living space that also fits in that same 60 square meter area. So the way you do that is by rolling the house around. And that is the dining room table where the surface, all the surfaces always stay level by gimbling like furniture on a boat or like a lamp on a boat. So you can see in that section, you know, that's that piece I was just pointing out. So everything rotates in place so it always stays level, but stuff disappears into the walls and then reappears when you roll it. So, you know, and, and this is just like, literally a couple of people for a few weeks. It's pretty thin, um, the, the design, but you get the intent. Um, we kind of digitally modeled uh, a way of making it work. We built a model with working furniture that we put on the robot. And this is in the ideas lab at UCLA. But so you see how all that stuff kind of gimbals to stay level and appears and disappears into the walls. And then we built a one-fifth scale model of it for the exhibition in Belgium, which those are the molds for it. Those are sitting on the street in front of my office. It was heavier than it should have been, but that's a carbon fiber shell. And then this is it in Belgium, operating. And we then ended up, after the exhibition, getting asked literally by Mark it was Frank that told Mark Zuckerberg about it. Mark Zuckerberg said, well, we need a bunch of these at Facebook. And so it lived at Facebook for three months. And what's great about Facebook, you take it to an architecture festival in Belgium, and everybody thinks their job is to be a doubter. So they're all like, well, what about the connection of the plumbing? What about electricity? What about this? What about that? In, in two weeks in Belgium, nobody ever said, can I get in it? The minute, even as we were setting it up at Facebook, all these 20 year olds are like, can we climb in it? How many people can get in it? Can we run it from inside? Can I run it off my phone? They all were like, let's have at it. So it, it went to Red Bull's headquarters. It, it's been all over the kind of Southern and Northern California tech industry spaces. And out of that, what we kept hearing from everybody is, how can we drive it? Um, so we ended up building this little interface um, just using Touch OSC, which is, you know, kind of universal interface, but mostly for kind of music mixing and synthesizing, so that you can download an application on your phone and download the, our particular interface, and you can drive it in two axes, and you can put it in demo mode, and you can also have presets for it. And now we've, we've built three of these little custom robots over time to run that 
just using off-the-shelf um, components and stepper motors. So anyway, you know, building this interactive interface uh, and having people be able to interact with its position um, ended up having a kind of uh, impact on things. So out of that, somebody that founded a company called us up and said they wanted one of them for retail. And they said, this is the person that said we want to connect the digital and the physical. Um, to kind of explain what this company does, it's a company called Curbside. And their idea is that right now goods get bought online from Amazon and they have to put all the stuff in specially built fulfillment centers on the edges of cities. And so you get these giant boxes outside of cities and every time you order something, and they're now doing some of it in an hour, something, they have to drive it from the edge of the city to wherever their customers are in small vehicles. So this person's idea is since we still have some stores, why don't we access the stores and treat them like Amazon fulfillment centers? So they now have about 60 Target stores where they access the online inventory of a store, they put it all into an interface and you buy stuff just like you would buy Amazon and then they have runners that go grab all the stuff you ordered, put it in a bag and then whenever you're near the store you drive up and they literally throw it in your car. So. Um, they do it also for, well, the one I'll show you is at a shopping mall, but they do it for multiple stores as well. So their idea was, what are we going to give people the stuff out of? So the first thing they did is they bought a few Airstream trailers and polished them up and put curbside on it. And everybody that would come to, the, to these stores and walk by this Airstream trailer, they're like, what, what are you guys doing here? Like, are you guys like making your own artisanal pickles or, you know, it had a whole hipster, it had the wrong, it was communicating the wrong message to them. <laughs> so they, you know, they also have this problem of navigating people from roads up to the particular space where the handoff happens. So, um, so what they defaulted to is they have you know, close to a hundred of these tents, which look like somebody's trying to sell you a credit card or something. So they said, what can we do to store goods temporarily, navigate people from streets up to this location, and communicate this intersection between the physical and the virtual, between online retail and physical stores. So, I mean, we had the idea of just a pin. So we ended up developing this prototype which has the, the pin which is kind of their brand and then the covered area and the storage for all the goods. And Jaron, who owns the company, I said, Jaron, you should take a look at this rolling house thing we did because we could make the pin follow the signal as people drive up to the store. Now he immediately, he just said yes. He didn't, he didn't say what about this, what about that. He just said yes, we have to have that. So, and you can see why. So this is a, this is a, um, a collage, but you can see in a sea of cars, what you need to know is where this one is. And now we're looking at some places where there's gonna be three or four of them. So you also have to know which one has the person that's gonna hand you your stuff. So. You know, we kind of did like a quick little animation to show them how the pin could change its color to match the background of your screen on your phone. So if your phone turns orange and you see the orange one, most people would figure out that that's where they should pull up. And we built a half scale model of it and worked out the robotics and they worked out. It also, we have to have that height because the proprietary receivers they have need to be um, about eight meters up in the air. So, you know, use more or less the same mechanism. These are all stepper motors that are made for um, uh, agriculture, 
for watering strawberry fields in Northern California so they can sit outside. And I shouldn't have had that in there. Okay, so this is the prototype as of about a week ago. Um, it's installed at, at this big mall in Glendale, California. And um, it doesn't yet have the motion in it. It'll have the motion in it in a week or two. Um, but the, the way it works is, you know, people will drive up. The city officials were really worried about traffic impact. And so I thought, here we go. You know, I gave the company all the lists of consultants and lawyers that I knew that dealt with traffic impact studies. And before they could even negotiate a retainer, what they did, which is what I love about Silicon Valley, is they said, we have you know, hundreds of people with cell phones working these places. We're gonna have one person video record every transaction. They uploaded it every night and got a week, week's worth of data on a website. They ground all the data up and they found out the average exchange time is 10.7 seconds for somebody to drive up, get their package and drive away. So, so what you do is, as you drive up, they know it's you, they walk out to your car, they ask you where you want the package, and they put it in your car. You can see the bags are there. So people that don't understand what this is, they have to figure out what's going on by the architecture, honestly. Um, you know, we built in this kind of uh, logo on it. What, this, is, this is just uh, photographs of them pulling the inventory. This is at a Target that's in the mall. So one of the people that works there has a cell phone. They, you get the order. They go to the store, they verify they actually have the stuff, they match it to what you ordered, they go check out in their own register in every one of the stores, they put it in a bag and the bag waits there, and then they send you a text and it says your stuff is ready whenever you want to get it. You have two days to get it, and if you don't pick it up, they just restock it. And then you pull up and 10 seconds later, they put it in the back seat of your car, they put it in the trunk of your car, and the company is, is growing 50% in revenue every month. So it's like, anyway, the other thing I would just tell all the students is I get paid in ownership. So I own like a few percent of this company. Um, and, and that's the model of practice that now I'm absolutely dedicated to is instead of one-time service fees, treating all building projects as much as you can like a royalty, but for sure participate, like own part of the company. So the, the other thing which is shameless of me is I just became chief creative officer of Piaggio Fast Forward, where we're doing lightweight urban mobility and all of the infrastructure that goes with that lightweight mobility and we really need architects with technical skills, with autonomy, with sensing technology, and some with robotics. So next year when you graduate, make sure, <laughs> look at piaggiofastforward.com because we, we had trouble finding the right kinds of people and what I know about EAC is the right kinds of people are here for this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's it, thanks. Thanks a lot, Greg, this was really impressive. I was checking out our students, there were some of them uh, like open mouth, <laughs> some of them like <laughs> rather scary, scared, <laughs> but I, I guess nobody ran away. Our faculty was uh, mm, smiling and nodding, Enrique, when we were talking of the minimal material, uh, Tomas with the vacuum forming of the um, fiber, and of course uh, Javier when you were speaking of uh, wind propulsion. <laughs> so you are at home, we share a lot of uh, the yeah. contents uh, uh, you explained, so um, uh, we really hope that uh, you'll come back to visit us uh, maybe 
It without without waiting other 10 years before coming back. <laughs> we would That's a deal. And uh, let's hope that from now on we can uh, collaborate more. And uh, thanks a lot again for coming here and uh, open the academic year 2015 2016. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Now let's have uh, some beer together, some potatoes, some music. Yeah. Thanks.